Other thing that's really kind of neat is we can um, we can estimate the number of eggs that females produce when they oviposit in the lab because they oviposit in the vials. We'll give you vials if you want to take vials with you today. They can oviposit in the vials, and we can photograph them and count the number of eggs. I'm just going to just curiosity sake show you what these photographs look like. But these are eggs with the developing larvae um, in the photograph. And then over here on this photograph, we have larvae that have hatched. And this is the first <coughs> stage in the life cycle. And here's the chorion of the egg of an insect. Not many people actually get to see that. So <laughs> um, I was really pleased when my photographs came out uh, showing this degree of resolution. Um, so <clears throat> we can estimate with one egg laying bout the, the numbers of potential larvae that will reappear in the stream. And in some of the females that are um, ovipos that we're collecting and are ovipositing in the lab, they're, they're um, producing anywhere from six to 700 eggs. So it's, it's quite a large amount of um, egg production in the wintertime in that really small fly, you're right. Okay. So now I want to talk a little bit more about um, their uh, life cycle as adults. Most coronamids are thought to be um, short-lived, maybe two to three days, and then they pretty much die. They don't feed as adults. All the energy and nutrients that they require as adults, they need to store up in their larvae living in the stream. But what we have found with the winter emerging species is that 50% uh, of them live when incubated at 6 degrees centigrade, which is well above what they can survive, live about 18.6 days. And we're trying to better understand why that's the case. We think that part of it is, part of why they live so long, why they have evolved that, is that if you're emerging in the winter time and you're out there on the snow trying to secure a mate, the, the chances of Finding a mate may be relatively small on some days because they just kind of walk around and encounter and then, then mate. And if they can actually live longer, they have more days or more opportunities to actually find a mate and then successfully mate and, and produce, you know, for, for females, fly back to the stream and, and produce um, the next generation. One other thing that's really interesting in terms of the way they oviposit or the way they produce the eggs in the lab, what we've done here is we've graphed you know, the number of females in some experiments that have oviposited within a certain time of period from when we collect them in the field. So if we collect females and um, basically in this experiment, a large number of them actually oviposit within three days of collecting. And then a smaller number, four to seven, seven, eight to eleven, and it keeps going down. But all of a sudden, it pops back up again. And what we see is that here we have um, females that have been in the lab for twelve to fifteen days, and they haven't oviposited. So maybe they didn't mate before we collected them, and now as they're aging. They're simply just you know, ovipositing egg masses because their physiology is failing. If, if that were the case, then we would expect that those eggs would not be fertile, they wouldn't produce larvae. But many of these egg masses of 12 to 15 day old females produce larvae. So we believe, and we need to do these experiments, we believe it's possible that they can reproduce without mating. This Parthenote's concept is called parthenogenesis, and we know this occurs in some other groups of insects, but it's not known for winter emerging insects. But we, we do think that you know, there's really basically two ways in which they can reproduce. If they mate it before we collect them, they produce eggs that um, have been fertilized 
if they haven't mated, they wait around a few days and then they simply start producing eggs without the input of you know, um, sperm uh, from the male. In many instances across insects, when parthenogenesis occurs, so when unfertilized eggs um, can produce a next generation, in many cases they tend to be mostly females. And sometimes when we're in the field in the winter time, we encounter large numbers of females. So once again, we need to do you know, some more quantitative testing, but once again, maybe some indication that there's at least one generation in possibly that could be a parthenogenetic generation in our streams. So this is kind of exciting.